What most people don't talk about is the relationship side of this game. Very often we, we, we talk about like competitive advantage and you know, how do we create that moat? How do we stay a few steps ahead? How do we make it really difficult for the competition? Anybody can go in and give money to Facebook. They'll just take the biggest bidder. They don't care who it is. They're the loyalty. Any competitor, especially well-funded, can go in and just outspend you or spend as much as you. But it's very difficult for somebody to come in and create a relationship with a hundred creators who understand your product and know how to speak about it. Like that's, that's not an easy thing to replicate. And so we're focused on building out essentially uh, an army of creators. Hello and welcome to the D2C podcast. I'm Eric Dick. Today, we're jumping in for a double dutch with returning guest Serjan Popovic, CMO of Crossrope. We last checked in with Serge in October of 2020 at the beginning of this pandemic-induced e-commerce and at-home fitness craze that absolutely skyrocketed Crossrope's growth. This podcast dials in on Crossroads' post-pandemic growth trajectory, as well as a few of the hard lessons that Surge learned during the market contraction since. You'll learn all about Crossroads' three-tiered layered system for influencer marketing and how you can start to apply it to your brand to find a never-ending stream of winning creative options, as well as a rundown of the indispensable tools and apps that Surgeon has been using to stabilize growth in this new normal. I hope you enjoy it. Let's jump to it. Did you know that the subscription market is predicted to grow to over $2.6 trillion by 2028? As a fast-growing area in commerce, subscriptions hold tremendous opportunities to build a community of customers who share your values. Recharge is the leading subscription management solution helping e-commerce merchants of all sizes launch and scale subscription offerings. Recharge powers the growth for over 15,000 subscription merchants and their communities, turning one-time transactions into long-term customer relationships. Whether you're a direct-to-consumer business or an omni-channel brand, merchants who use Recharge are able to experience predictable revenue, increased customer loyalty, and higher average order values. So turn transactions into relationships and experience seamless subscription commerce with Recharge. Get started today with the subscriptions payment solution trusted by over 50 million consumers worldwide by heading over to rechargepayments.com forward slash DTC. Welcome back to the DTC podcast, Serge. We spoke, uh, you're one of my first, I looked at it, you were like 38. You're the number, number 38. We're up to over 200 now. Uh, and way back in October of 2020, we spoke about Cross Ropes, uh, amazing, uh, growth journey. And I, I've seen you, you know, I'm, you're doing your, you know, you're doing your own, uh, CMO content, which is, which is great. Uh, I can just see lots of things happening over there. And I, and I remember when we spoke last time, we were just at the beginning of, the pandemic, like fitness at home boom that, that you were sort of reaping the whirlwind on. And I just wanted to start by like catching up, catch me up on Crossrope's growth journey since those, those early days of, of uh, that, that e-commerce pandemic boom. Yeah. It's nice to be back, Eric. Um, yeah, man, October, 2020, we we're just saying what a felt like an eternity ago. Um, and yeah, uh, that was, you know, for us, a really crazy period. I mean, the last two years plus have just been, um, have been really crazy, but yeah, to sort of catch up on everything, uh, 2020 in general was obviously just bananas, uh, being in that space and having a, uh, a home workout solution. You know, we always sort of pitched it as a portable workout solution, you know, with cross rope, you have this interchangeable jump rope system for those who don't know. And then a companion app that comes with it that guides you along your workout. So we had, um, you know, March, April, when, when things started kicking off with the pandemic, we quickly transitioned everything into a, all, or all our messaging and creative to this home workout vibe. And man, it was like somebody just gave us a massive megaphone and our, we were just able to uh, really get the message out there. It was resonating with everybody. I think in October, we talked about the power of creative when it came to that. And we had this pretty large library of assets to tap into. And one of them was just this shoot we had done, um, I think out in Nashville with, uh, you know, a guy and a girl just jumping rope indoor, outdoor. And we just used that creative and it just crushed during that period. So 
It's so um, yeah, crazy it was, when you have that angle, when you just, when you have, it's so crazy when you have that angle and it just changes everything. It's just a subtle change in the pro the product didn't change, but this subtle shift in light on the product caused it to take off like wildfire, given what was happening in the world. That's really cool to hear. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I've been thinking a lot about the power of that message. There's a, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's, it's relevant. I was listening to this other podcast episode and another show talking, I think to the founder of these guys or this guy who founded these loom earplugs and they had a, and so they were designed basically to, um, for ravers, right? When you go out to a party, you pop these things in and you know, you can still enjoy your time, enjoy the music. So obviously for them, the pandemic went in the other direction, right? And nobody was partying anymore. Right. So their key message around being these aesthetically pleasing, cool uh, earplugs uh, that you wear at parties or at raves that didn't resonate. Nobody went to parties anymore. Right. But they caught wind of one of their influencers sort of talking about how they use these uh, earplugs made for ravers uh, to basically watch their kids at home. It's mayhem in the house. Right. And so it's this mom that started wearing them just to like stay sane in the house. Right. And that was like blowing up and they had no idea what was going on. And then they pivoted their whole business around um, sort of this new hook, this new message around this, you know, specifically for this segment of moms and dads at home, you know, who want a little bit of peace and quiet, but they're not fully isolated from the sound. Like at least you still want to obviously hear your kids. I thought that was amazing uh in terms of the power of a key like you're talking about a key message a key hook and really understanding that you know there you've probably got a product with a lot of different use cases for different people and it's on you to go out there and figure out sort of what message and what hook resonates um with what audience segment and just test the hell out of it and so anyway i thought that was just a I thought it was cool sharing that little story because it goes back to what you're saying for us, although not as drastically different, right? It still goes to show that you got to meet people where they're at, right? People are looking for home workouts. It was, you know, it wasn't rocket science to figure, figure that out. You put that in front of them and it, you know, it works. And it also, it makes me think of just the size of the audience, which is like, uh, you know, the size of, of parents at home looking for a little peace and quiet. Uh, it pro probably a decent overlap with parents also looking to go out and rave and be sensible about their hearing. Uh, but it's a much bigger audience, you know, parents versus ravers necessarily. So it just opens, it could open the floodgates. You know, we're going through a similar thing right now on the education side. I've always built courses with this idea of like, okay, we're going to build courses for active practitioners and they're going to be that next level up where you already know how to use the tools, but we're going to teach you how to scale them. And then I've just, I've just been reflecting on that. I'm like, that's like 1% of the market. You know, 1% 1, 1 of the market are those advanced users. And by pivoting to something that, you know, we, we maybe may take for granted a little bit more, some of the knowledge we have, uh, that we take for granted about some of these things. If we put that out there, that probably opens up this whole other audience of, uh, of people, which uh, we're yeah, looking forward to. Yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, that, that's that's the game. And I think you know we can dive in at some point today, the, the creator uh, program and how that fits in and how it allows you to test those things at scale. Um, and sort of to close out, I guess, the, the last two years, I mean, that, yeah, so 2020 was uh, really crazy. And then... I mean, we probably followed the same, you know, cycle and pattern as most other, uh, let's say, at home or connected fitness experiences, even though we're technically not connected. Um, but so, yeah, it was crazy 20 growth in 2021 or in 2020. And we were uh, basically using that growth to fuel like all these other channels. Let's get into podcast advertising. Let's get our SMS program up. Let's get you know, this, this big affiliate push, let's get really into influencer marketing, the more traditional route that we did a couple of years back where you sort of pay for sponsored posts. Let's do these big YouTube sponsored play. Like we just did everything. And the, uh, the challenge with that is that during a period where you've got you just the floodgates are open, like everything works. You're not learning a lot, right? You're sure we, we spent a ton of time, putting fires out because everything was breaking at that pace. 
um, and trying to do everything we could to stay in stock or air freighting for months, all, all this type of stuff just to keep things moving. Uh, but on the marketing side, I was like, you're, you're not learning anything. Everything is just working, right? And so what started happening and, uh, as we got into the early parts of 2021, um, or pretty much all through 2021, it was basically a slow and uh, sometimes fast, but mostly a slow and gradual uh, reversal back to like this new normal, right? Which took a while to sort of uh, hit there, you know, and it's somewhere between, you know, where we were pre-pandemic and where we were, you know, peak pandemic. Um, the challenge is that we've, as a company, we've just never gone through a contraction, right? And you got this anomaly of a year um, in 2020 throws off all your data points. You know, we have to basically, for me, it was a great, you know, difficult, but great learning experience, right? You know, it's growth at a consistent, you know, we were growing 40, 50% a year every year. Um, to suddenly go to a contraction and have to like consolidate channels to have to go through some, make some difficult decisions to actually try to figure out, all right, like what's working, what's not, um, let's stop all this. Let's try that. You know, like it, it took a, a lot of t- tinkering and figuring it out to get us back to sort of like this stable state. So that was the journey of 2021. Honestly, it was probably the the hardest year and for me, but also the one that had, you know, offered the most from a learning perspective as a, as a CMO. And then, you know, in 2022, we're, you know, back at sort of like our, you know, now that we're stabilized, now it's all these other problems and, and things we're dealing with, like everybody else in the e-com space, figuring out how to acquire customers, you know, with the, in this new uh, ecosystem, how to deal with, you know, uh, these difficult times from an economic and global standpoint, how to factor all that stuff. So there's a lot going on, but it feels a lot more stable. Um, and, you know, now it's just building back up. So that's kind of been the journey. It's definitely been, if there's ever a definition of a roller coaster ride, this would have been it. Um, but yeah, no, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been wild. When you did that, let's call it the surge in your marketing efforts where, you know, when I you, when you were feeling, <laughs> when you were feeling the, uh, you know, you're trying the diversification when you're going sort of ham on diversification, you're trying podcasts, you're doing all these things. That's, I think that's such an interesting position to be in where you're really just trying to fill that top of funnel. Everything's working. I have two questions. One, what, what, like when the water came back in from all of that, like what were the thing, what were the big learnings that you took from that? Like I obviously maybe about how to go about deploying that much diversity, but also like within the things that you tried, what are some of the things that really stuck when you, when you poured all that effort into experimentation? Sure. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the scaling and the, the diversification, um, I think I'll start with like one thing I wish we had done differently and lowered our ROAS targets uh, at that period. I think we've never seen growth and scale at that pace. And so we were still sort of like stuck in this, hey, we need to like kind of hit these targets. But at those incremental Revenues, we should have definitely, you know, lower, lower targets, reduce blended discounting strategies, like all these things that you think in just your day to day e-com um, or your typical uh, playbook strategies. Right. We should have just tossed those out the window and just like, you know, sure, it could have created some other problems on the supply chain side and getting all but. From a marketing and e-com standpoint, I, you know, that would be a learning I'd take if we hit another sort of scaling uh, or aggressive scaling uh, position like that in the future. That's definitely something I'll be looking to do, pull back on discounting, pull back on, on ROAS targets. So that was definitely a key takeaway for me for, for the future. Um, in terms of like as we started contracting and started looking at some of the channels, um, there were a lot of channels and we can talk about influencer marketing in particular as, as an example, since I know we'll touch on that a little bit. It was, um, we call, internally, we, we use the term like pressing the I believe button quite a bit, you know, or you do your best to try to model all your attribution the best way you can and get a sense of what's what channels are working, what channels aren't. And we spent a 
good amount of money um, with a very prolific sort of influencer marketing agency, really trying to like figure that space out. Everybody was talking about influencer marketing at that point anyway, but it was the, like I said, you know, find an influencer with the, you know, with the biggest following, pay them a chunk of money and then cross your fingers that, you know, something magical is going to happen on the other end. And so um, we had some winners. We had a lot of losers and, Overall, it was a really difficult channel to um, to justify those level of spends. And if you've ever worked with an influencer marketing agency like that, the agency fees are are just ridiculous. Like it just does not it does not make any sense. And we just couldn't we couldn't make it work. So as we started contracting, that was one of the first channels that we just started looking at very closely. Like it's very easy to press the I believe button when when top line is just, you know, uh, running crazy and you've just got this, you know, and obviously we've got great margins at our price points and, you know, we had some things working for us, but as things started contracting, um, you know, that was one of the first channels we started really analyzing, like, all right, is this working? Is this not a decent spend? How, how do we sort of pull back? And eventually it was just sort of like, all right, this, this is not a channel that's, uh, that we can prove out at this scale. Maybe when we when we hit these numbers again, we can bring it back. So I think a number of podcasting kind of went through a similar thing where it's like, all right, this is great. We're, you know, uh, at these levels, it, we can make it work at these lower levels. We can't. Right. And so it was just kind of going through those learnings and adjusting. But what it probably did do, and it's what what you kind of wrote for wrote about for us recently, is it sort of forced you to to kick into gear your your own content strategy, really, like your own influencer to creator pipeline strategy. And so rather than focusing on these big splashy individual shots that you're taking downfield with podcasts, building out a really sustainable uh, creator marketing flywheel, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there were two things that that we sort of uh, learned and adjusted. Uh, I think, if, I don't know if you remember, but when we spoke last in October, um, we talked a lot about creative, but in a, in a different, um, from a different perspective, it was very YouTube advertising, Facebook advertising oriented, but we were funding sort of like these, um, you know, high production value shoots, very, you know, very robust, very great, like great quality content, but you're getting, one piece of content uh, that's very expensive, right? And so we talked about sort of the value of getting a lot of different intros and getting a lot of different outros and just giving yourself some room to work with on the editing side so you can try a lot of different things. But ultimately, you're still working with the same piece of content. And that worked for a while. I think the with iOS 14 and the changes there, you know, it, it for that just stopped working. And it was really because um, the value of the creative asset just increased so much. Um, and it's for, for me, I started thinking about, all right, it's not, it's not about the, the val or the quality of the creative Not we got to get to like the quantity side. And so there, there's this one, I think there's this one, study I always found interesting that was sort of parallel to help, help kind of paint that picture. But there was that, there was that one professor that split his photography class into two groups. In group A, he said, I'm going to grade you guys on the quantity of the shots you take, right? Um, so if you hit hundred, if you take a hundred shots and you hand those in, you get an A. And then a second group, he said, group B, I'm going to grade you on your quality, right? I want you to hand in one really good piece, like really good photo, right? And when he assessed the results at the end, uh, who, who sort of created better photos, it was the quantity group by a long shot. And that's because the, by shooting 100 photos, they basically forced themselves to get creative, to experiment with different styles and angles and shots. Whereas the quality group really focused in on sort of trying to get this like perfect shot. And I thought that was really good analogy to what we're doing here in the creator space, right? It's no longer about trying to find that one perfect creative and crossing your fingers that that's what's going to hold up your performance marketing uh, campaigns or, or even your account. Um, now it's like, 
how do we get into the volume game? Let's just test a lot of different, you know, angles and hooks and messages. You go back to those audience segments. How do you test like, can we get some moms to shoot some content with a jump rope showing them working out in front of their garage while their kids are playing outside? Can we show, you know, this someone who's never jump rope before and how they've sort of like progressed from zero to one. Can we show like, and so you can map out all your, all these sort of uh, messages and hooks based on all your USPs, uh, you know, relative to all your different um, personas. And so uh, that's kind of like how the, the whole creator thing involved. And what we learned from all that influencer marketing, man, we, we had some, I just remember like going through some of these with a the social media manager. You pay like 10K for these sponsored posts. You've done your the best you could on vetting it, making sure the audience is right. But there's no there's no test, right? You, you spend that 10K and then you hope that it produces some results. And I remember spending 10K on one and getting like seven clicks. That's it. That's all we got. And I was like, man, this is uh this is these are like sometimes really, really hard. Um, to swallow, right? And so for us, we started pivoting where we we knew there's value in the in the creative on the advertising side. How do we sort of get more to it, more from it? And so that's kind of how we pin, pivoted from this influencer program where we're paying for paid sponsor posts to building out a creator program where we're focused on, you know, building out essentially uh, an army of creators we can sort of tap into for um, creating a large volume of different kinds of content that we can um, give to our performance marketing team. So we can go into the nuts and bolts of that in terms of what I wrote, but that's sort of the big picture in a nutshell, how we've been thinking about it, that that transition from quality to quantity and influencer to creator. I just like the, I like your approach to where it's, it's not a full, Hey, just find a bunch of, creators and get them to you know slam new scripts into into something there still is that placement aspect so you're like okay i want moms who create content at home kind of thing so then it's like going out and finding those kind of creators that make us the specific kind of content that fits a little bit of the hook or you know the message that you're trying to get out there d2c marketers let's get real how many hours have you wasted searching for brand influencers only to come up empty-handed it's time to stop spending time searching, scrolling, and haggling with influencers and start using creator marketing with Hashtag Paid. With Hashtag Paid, you can find your perfect creator match for your brand in less than 10 minutes every time. Getting started is easy. Just select your audience and campaign objectives, pick from a short list of creators, and hit run. It's just that easy. There's a reason why Hashtag Paid is the number one rated influencer marketing platform for D2C brands. And as a D2C podcast listener, you can even get up to $500 in account credit until September 30th for your first campaign. Just go to go.hashtagpaid.com slash DTC pod to get started. So there's probably, it'd be interesting, can you talk a little bit about the strategy as to, as to how, when it comes to actually sourcing creators to kind of scratch the itches you're hoping to scratch? Yeah. Oh man. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and I think like, I, I won't go into like the full details of the piece that I wrote for you guys. I think that spells out a little bit of how to like the basics of sourcing content and different layers and tapping into your existing customer base, going into product seeding and broadening that up. So I think that's a, I'll touch on it a little bit. I think the, when it comes to sort of scratching, scratching your own itch, um, there's a couple things. So I think the way we've started approaching it, um, is we're starting with the USPs, right? So for us, we're thinking about, um, on, at the cross side, what are all the things that sort of make it unique from a workout standpoint? So we've got the portability aspect, right? We've got the quick, effective and convenient aspect of it. You know, we've got the, um, Actually, just let's call it quick and convenient. Then there's the effective aspect of it, and it burns more calories per hour than most exercises, um, et cetera. So you can kind of go down down your list. Now, then we start mapping out like, all right, who who do these USPs like speak to, right? Who cares the fa- about the fact that this is a portable workout experience? If you go to the gym every single day, you don't care about that. But if you're a young, busy professional and you're on the road, you know, uh, half the year and always jumping around, 
All right, so that's going to speak to you. If you're a mom, like I mentioned earlier, who wants to be at home, you know, the portability aspect, the convenience aspect speaks to you. So then we just kind of like for each USP, you map out the different personas, right? And then we sort of, for each one of those, then it's just a long brainstorming session of, all right, what are the messages and what are the hooks, right? So this gives us a little bit of a framework on the messaging that we want to test out. And this sort of like lives inside our creator briefs, right? Which we ultimately send to uh, the creators that we want to work with for inspiration, right? And then when it comes to product seeding, I mean, there's... There's the manual ways of doing it, which is kind of what I what I wrote a little bit about where, you know, if you've been around for a while, you know, going to TikTok, going to Instagram, going to YouTube even and type in your brand, right? See what pops up, who's already creating content, who's already a customer and reach out to them to see if, hey, are you cool with us using this content? Would you be interested in creating more content? You know, that's the, probably the easiest place to start because these are you know, people who are already customers and they're creating content with your thing. That's, that's the, that's what you want. Um, if you're, if you haven't been around for a while, or if you want to broaden up your sourcing, then you go into the product seeding route, right? Then you sort of like the, the way I like to think about it is from a, a start very niche and broaden out. So for us, I just type in for those same channels, go in and I type jump rope, jump rope workouts, jump rope fitness, you know, uh, jump rope workouts for weight loss you can get, you know, really vary it up and just see what creators pop up. And I'll find a ton of creators who are already creating content, just not using a cross rope set. Right. So these are um, people who, you know, I can reach out to say, hey, love your content. Would you be interested in trying a weighted jump rope system? Now, this doesn't layer in the the audience yet. I think that's, that's a, I'll touch on in a second, but just to wrap up that piece, the broadening aspect then is like, you know, I'll go in as a next layer and then type in like, uh, home workouts. If you go into TikTok and you type in home workouts, you find all these creators who are creating, creating amazing content, you know, just not using a jump rope. So it's the same sort of outreach, you know, love your content. Would you be interested in trying that? That's a really easy way to, you know, start sourcing content. Um, typically, it'll really depend on your product, but I like to, you know, for us and in our price point, I like to ask for something in return when I'm gifting a product, right? And we're at a time right now where, uh, you, you know, and I'm, you listen to some of these podcasts of people talking about their own programs, like these are really, this is a time game. It's not a cost game, right? Like, uh these people aren't expecting big payouts or any payouts to be, to be honest, right. Even usage rights for whitelisting, you know, are usually just rolled in. Like people are excited to get the opportunity to be promoted by the brand, right. Cause we're talking about micro nano type creators. When you go from an influencer program to a creator program, it's less about the influencer, right. And it's more about um, the, the, can they create engaging content uh, to show showcase your product and your brand? That's all you care. If they have one follower, that doesn't matter, right? I want that piece of content so I can give to my performance marketing team and they can run, run that. So that's one side of it. The other side of it now is like when I've through that exercise of mapping out all your audiences, where are all the moms at in the creator program style? Um, you know, I go in and I'll start when I do search up home workouts or, you know, a mom workout or whatever. Let me make a list of all the creators who I think could fit that bill. Right. And then I'll send them a, a brief and I'll ask them, hey, you guys, interest, are you interested in creating a piece of content around this? There are all sorts of nuances. Your outreach game's got to be strong. You got to have, you know, it's, it's a very process oriented game. But if you can get it right. You can build an army of these creators who, and, and not a lot of people talk about this, you know, when you think back to the objective of a creator program, it's, you know, uh, it used to be very conversion oriented, like two years ago when we were running this influence, we were trying to justify it as a, it's like, hey, if they post this, like what's, can we at least break even? Yeah, right. as a channel too, right? Like really thinking about it, okay, this is a, an exactly. incremental yeah. traffic channel in a way. Right. Now it's like, all right, we're not optimizing for conversions. It's a different game. What we're after is building a large library of content 
that we can deliver to our performance marketing team, whether it's internal or an agency, right? They can then use that content, figure out what the winners are, report back to you around like, hey, here are the messages, the hooks, the segments, the audiences, the angles, that this, these are the things that are working. Let's create more of that. Then you basically, your whoever's running your, your, your uh, creator program, now they know it's like, okay, let's find more of these young professionals. That really seems to work. Or moms are working, but uh, let's try to get more of them running this message or this hook, right? And now uh, what I was going to say is, what uh what most people don't talk about is the relationship side of this game. I, I think our, our CEO said it really well when we were talking one day. It's like we very often we 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 talk about like um you know competitive advantage and you know other way to jump rope systems have started rolling out on the market and this and that. And so it's like how do we how do we you know how do we create that moat? Right. How do we um, stay a few steps ahead? How do we make it really difficult for the competition? Right. And it's like anybody can go in and give money to Facebook. Right. They'll, they'll just take the biggest bidder. Right. They don't, they don't care who it is. There's no loyalty. There's nothing. You know, so any competitor, especially well funded, can go in and just outspend you or spend as much as you or play that same game as you. But it's very difficult for somebody to come in and create a relationship with a hundred uh, uh, creators who understand your product and know how to speak about it. Like that's, a, that's not an easy thing to replicate. And so, you know, yes, you're optimizing your creator program to deliver a high volume of different kinds of content for your performance marketing team, but you're also building relationships with creators. Some of them might become big stars you know, that happens, you know, and there's a loyalty there. Some of them, you know, there's a whole other side of the program where it's like, hey, some of them are, you test it. It's like, wow, you, your content just blew up, right? How do we do more of it, right? And so then you can get into like, what if there, does an affiliate model make sense for this particular creator? Does a, an ambassador program make sense where, you know, now you can layer in some exclusivity, right? Or they can start introducing you to the people they know, right? And then it's, then you're okay. Now it's like you've vetted and you've tested a creator versus two years ago where you just kind of like th throw the 10K in the bucket and hope for the, you know, hope for the best. Now you've actually like, all right, you've proven that this creator can create content that converts for you. Let's build up this relationship, right? And so those, there's a lot more to it. Obviously, there, uh, I, you know, I try to kind of hit the, the high points, but that's how we've been thinking about it. It's not necessarily an easy thing to build out like i said it's very process oriented as yeah. you can it's why the agencies are so expensive i guess right because it is so hands-on messaging people all the time coordinating and i i, well, I just think it's a really neat idea of as like a moat extension because i think there's so many um brands and products in the space that are either they're not come on maybe they're on the verge of being commoditized or they're at a risk of being commoditized and that ability that you can kind of extend your moat by building these kind of distribution channels through relationships is i think something really valuable to the audience yeah no i mean hey, building relationship is nothing is nothing new i just you know we're now it's just you got to think about it strategically right and i think that you know imagine if you had 20, 30, 50, 100 creators or affiliates or ambassadors that you've built relationships with and you're launching a new product or you're going in a Black Friday, Cyber Monday or you're, you know, whatever it might be. And you enroll each of them, you know, to help promote this. Like your reach is going to be, not only reach is going to be uh, like much bigger, but you'll, ha you'll be able to tap into and get them to create all this amazing content, Right. In, the, in a way that only they can speak about it, right? So there's definitely a lot of benefits from this type of from this type of program. And it's just it's a it's a network. It's not if you do it right, it's an ongoing network. So it's not a one and done. Sh you know, it's not these one and done shots that you're taking with people that may never have an affiliation with the brand again. You're cultivating people, and I love that idea of graduating them potentially to become affiliates or other things, so that they they can take on other dimension of uh, dimensions of value for the brand. Um, I think everyone that's listening should be thinking about how to build their own uh, 
content distribution network because it, it doesn't, it's funny, like the number one, I was seeing uh, Nick Shackelford do a post the other day about like the number one thing that, that marketers in our space are always looking for is just finding winners to scale. It comes down to like the creative really is uh, the new oil in a lot of ways, yeah. uh, you know, you, you just need it with the lack of data, with a lot of lack of transparency that, that we're kind of getting from these systems. You just, that volume of creative is so important. What, what, what sort of volumes are you talking? Like how many, how many fresh pieces a week are you aiming to deliver to your internal and external teams from this program? Yeah, no, that, that's a, that's a good question. It's going to be different for every brand. Um, and I've spoken to a number of them and some of them, I, I, one thing I just, before I answer that, that I think is also important, like the end uh, sort of goal is to have a diverse set of content that you can deliver, create and deliver, right? So sourcing through creators isn't the only way to do that. Some teams have done really well by building out an internal team, right? I've talked to some some teams, they have a creative strategist on staff, a couple of video photographers and videographers, and each week they sit down and you know, they come up with, they look at the numbers, they look at sort of like uh, the performance of the creatives over the past week and just like ID, right? All right, this, let's try this hook and let's try this. And then they knock out like 20 creatives each week and deliver that. So uh, then there's the other way to sort of supplement your uh, sourcing. And that's through, you've got these, all these creator platforms that have been popping up, your billows, your incense, your B-roll, where you can go in almost like a 99 designs, but I don't think they're really bidding on it or I can't remember. Um, but the point is you can go in and you can get a piece of creative for 50 bucks or hundred bucks, whatever it might be. So that's another way to sort of supplement it. Um, or you can do some stuff. Um, you know, you don't need to like a, a full shot, right. But you can get like a contracted videographer or something to, to, to shoot certain things. So there's other ways to supplement the content. So the, the, inf the creator, um, key sourcing piece is just one means. It's just that with those others, you don't build that army, right? You don't build those relationships. So that's why I, I like that route the best. In terms of how many creatives, that's something to go in with your performance marketing team. And, you know, that's, I don't, I don't even think I, I could say we have an answer to that yet because it fluctuates. Um, it's really like how, how it'll depend on how much are you spending, Right. If you've got, if you're running 10 campaigns and they're all winners, like you're not, why roll anything in, right? Like just, just keep pushing what's working, right? Um, so for us, I mean, it can vary anywhere from 20 to 50 a month, right? Um, challenges we've run into before, like creating too much, right? It's almost like if you're thinking about it from a, from a workflow or not a workflow, but a flow standpoint in and out, right? You know, if I'm delivering a hundred pieces of content every week and the performance marketing team can only test 10, right? You're basically, it's an inefficient use of your resources, right? Like let's dial back how much we're creating or let's bump up the spend, you know, if, that, if it's justified to be able to test or whatever it is, but you got to find that optimal balance of how much you're creating, how much you're, you're basically flowing through and testing, and then how much are you learning through the process? So uh, you'll kind of have to go through that learning experience and have that conversation with your performance marketing team at your spend levels. But um, yeah, you don't want to do too much. You don't want to do too little, but you've got to play around with it a little bit. Have you noticed anything in terms of creative fatigue changing, you know, since we last spoke essentially, like, are, do you think creatives are sort of lasting about as long as they used to last? Are they lasting less? Are you, are you finding winners that are still working like that work long-term still? Not as long-term as they used to. Um, but yeah, you'd still, we still experience creative fatigue when you're trying to like really squeeze as much out of like one creative as, as you possibly can. Um, so we, but it, it happens less just because if we do have a piece of creative that's working from a creator and we're trying to like amplify it, usually we're already working with them on some, on the next piece that we can roll in. Right. Or, um, what a lot of agencies, or at least the agencies that are, that are somewhat focused on the creative aspect as well, 
they've got teams that are chopping it up and creating different variations, creating montages, DJing the hell out of the, the, that works as well um, to offset some of the fatigue. Um, so, but yeah, there's still fatigue. I, I just find like with the, at the pace we're rolling out from the same, you know, new creatives from the same creator doesn't happen as often. Is there anything that you could point to? I'm just looking at it's such a beautiful website, so so nicely designed. Is there anything that you could say that you've implemented? And again, this actually probably ha- have a head of, of CX uh, who's maybe working more on the CRO side. But is there anything that you've implemented or your team's implemented on the CRO side over the last little while that's really paid dividends for either conversion rate or things like AOV? Um, I mean, there's there's been a handful, but I think one that I'll probably share uh, just because it ties into some of the influencer stuff we're talking about. Uh, If you go into any of the product pages, if you go into like the Get Lean set or which which uh, one of the core sets, Get Lean Set, Get Strong Set, or the bundle, what you'll see as you scroll just below the fold is these vertically formatted videos. Ah, yeah. So. The idea behind these, uh, it's a tool called VideoWise, um, is that it, it's sort of like a, a unique way to have, to show what the product is and how, and show it in the hands of actual customers. I think previously brands have done this by having like an Instagram feed sort of at, at the bottom of the page or show. This is more, I think this is much more powerful in that I can show somebody unboxing it. So you know exactly what you're, uh, what you're getting when you open it. I can show somebody, you know, spinning the handle and showing like the really smooth rotation of the rope. I can, it can show somebody jumping with it. So you can see what it looks like in action. Um, and so you can load up whatever you want. You can pull in something that's already on your Instagram feed. So for us, all that content that we're creating, we can tap into, um, to show off on these product pages. Um, and it works much better than like, a you know, a what's included with four bullet points. And your social feed is random too. It depends on what people are talking about, I guess. Like with this, you're getting to frame the exact, you know, using the, the, the images that you want exactly to tell the story that you want. Uh, that's a great shout. Yeah. So um, I, I really love that tool. A lot of people, a lot of our customers have mentioned it, um, as like, you know, um, something they enjoyed as part of their shopping journey through some surveys, et cetera. But um, yeah, I think it's like, obviously video is just taken more and more of a front row seat, not just in the uh, advertising side, but on your website, um, you know, and and other touch points, like how are you showcasing uh, this user generated content so they can show the product in real life used authentically by, you know, your customers. How, uh, head to head, how are, how is TikTok comparing to your reels performance these days, would you say? Cause I, they're coming after TikTok so hard with the exact same format. We're finding on the subscription side that actually reels is now quite a bit outperforming TikTok, which is kind of interesting. What, what are you seeing between those two platforms? I mean, honestly, TikTok, we're still trying to figure out. <laughs> yeah. That, that is, a uh, the, still feels like the wild west in terms of what's working, what's not. We'll have some, some, again, some winners and then it's just like cricket. So, um, whereas reels are more consistent, um, from a performance standpoint, I mean, for us, I would say, um, if, if there's one thing that's worked really well over the last little bit would be like the whitelisting. Um, Whitelisting just is, you know, for all, for almost all the metrics are just outperforming everything else. Um, and, with, and this is even with micro influencers, right? This doesn't have to be a big name handle. This is still just from micro influencers handles that you're talking about whitelisting. Yeah. Like obviously we don't whitelist every single creator. We, we do try to whitelist some of the one, the larger ones, but um, yeah, like the, part of the creator program is like, there's, there's no loss on just rolling and rolling them into your whitelisting program and, and testing it through their account. Right. They don't like to your point, they don't need a, a big following. Right. Um, but just when it's coming authentically, their content through their account to our site, like it's just like the click through rates and the CPC, everything is just way better. Um, so we're really trying to 
optimized for that where the account, you know, is very heavily skewing towards whitelisting, you know? That's interesting. Um, and so, yeah, that's, and we're trying to crack the same code on the TikTok side of the Spark ad posts and, and, and all that stuff. Um, it's just a different animal. I, I do like the potential of TikTok quite a bit just because of the way the algorithms where the algorithm works and, you know, where the, the follower count really doesn't matter if somebody creates, it, it puts the focus on the content, which is what the whole thing's built on. But, you know, if, if we can find a creator on TikTok, we can create a good piece of content, you know, it doesn't matter if they have one follower or a million followers, like it's, they both have potential to get a lot of views. Um, the challenge with TikTok is people just don't get off the platform, you know? And so that is. it's just figuring out creative ways of getting them off or, you know, and motivating. You know, it is a self-motivation, but like there is a lot of uh, uh, self-development on the platform. That's a huge tenant. I think of probably a lot of people's feeds. So there's probably a way to do it. It's funny. I actually bought way, I told this on the podcast before, but I bought weights off of TikTok. I bought, uh, oh, yeah. you know, those like selectable weights, but it was a total scam. And it literally delivered me like baby rattles that were like just these like, so like you, there needs to be some higher quality fitness advertisers on the platform so they can stop scamming <laughs> me out of these baby rattle weights. But I'm getting huge with them which is great <laughs> that's hilarious sorry about it's, it's, that. I, it just made me think I, back to your your point about authenticity and that experiment with with photographs uh and and it makes me wonder like were the second photographs better because they just it's probably because they tried more wild angles but it's probably also because they were just done in a way that was maybe even less they were more they were more authentic because they were less framed less polished like which seems to be the theme with a lot of this kind of creative like that the more you can actually you can strike real authentic moments that people can relate to that's really what drives success on these platforms versus a lot of that polish for sure i mean people They've shown, I guess, that um, the more or I guess the less you can make your ad look like an ad, the better, right? Yeah. The lo- that, the better- that goes back to the old Never Blue days when I was in a performance marketer and an affiliate network, we were running ads on Facebook and we were realized that when we made our ads look like the Facebook interface – uh, they, like what in the same colors or any anything to do with the same platform they were in, they would perform so much better. Facebook outlawed it, of course, immediately. But it's just amazing when you yeah, the more native you and it's the same with advertisers in our newsletter as well. The more native a read, the more it feels like just value. Uh, the better it always performs on all ends. Yeah, and so the the way to achieve that is is not through like this high production quality type content, like. I think people, maybe that's sort of made its way through everyone's sort of system in the sense that now you just, you, it's on, on, on almost like your condition that when you see a high production value video from a brand, it's, it's automatically an ad, right? So it's possible. I don't know if it is, but to me, it just feels like when you play the volume game, you're right. It's more authentic, um, you know, to me, it's really about the experimentation because with less data, you just don't know what's going to work, right? And you, it's a big risk to try to, you know, put a good chunk of your resources into one Hail Mary, right? So the game for us is how do we just, how do we just create, uh, increase our chances of finding a winner, right? That's really, that's really the game. So, um, yeah. Okay, so I forget. I actually didn't review the podcast last time, so I forget. I, I, I maybe I didn't even ask you this, but we like to ask if we were to give you a fifty thousand dollar grant, uh, you know, to leverage in the next thirty days um, from Pierre Trudeau, uh, or I mean Justin Trudeau. He's he's giving this out. Where would you put it into your marketing to see the biggest impact? Would you would you go ham on creative creators again? Is there any other experiment you're eyeing up that you'd use that for? Um. Yeah, I mean, a, a chunk of it I would definitely put into sort of the creator program. And there, there are definitely tools out there. Like Grin is a great example of a tool that's, you know, it streamline, streamline, streamlines a lot of these process-oriented things that you have to do all into one platform that can save you a ton of time, right? It's also not expensive. It's at least two, three K a month uh, to use a platform like that. So... I really wanted to go all in on the plat on um, 
on the creator program, I'd look to, um, I'd look to, uh, basically find any tools that can help me streamline, streamline the process. A couple I'll sort of mention, it would be grin. There's tools like reach harm where you can like that help you. One of our agencies just started using it. And these things are just, it's crazy how far like the text coming along, but you load up all your videos in this, in this platform. And then it just like, it, it chops it up and you can create like hundreds of variations, you know? So these tools like these would help me, um, really speed up the the process, um, and amplify the program. So I'd say a, a, a chunk I'd put towards that. The second piece I would do is probably the, let's just say half and half. The second half I'd go ham on YouTube, uh, influence, YouTube sponsored placements. Those have just done, Unlike influ- Instagram sponsored placements, like YouTube sponsored placements just have so much drag. Like we, there's still a t- good number of the videos, uh, the sponsored videos we did in 2020 are still driving revenues every single week for us to this day. Just if you find the right people who create the good content, like the content, you know, it's a, it's a search engine. So people are going to find that piece of content on an ongoing basis. So I would just really um, like amplify that side of it, try to find some more uh, creators in that space and just, you know, um, try to create some good videos. Great answer. There was one other tool you mentioned in the, in your piece um, about how to make sure that you're collecting all the videos that are made about your product that may be posted all around the web. Do you remember what, what tool was that? Yeah, it's archive. It's a Shopify app. Um, I think it's free to use up to a certain threshold, but yeah, you basically, it integrates with your Instagram and your TikTok and pulls in all the, anytime you're tagged, um, on a reel, on a TikTok, um, on a story, it'll, it'll pull it in there and then you can download it. You can reach out to the, you know, see who the creator is, et cetera. But really for us, it's just brings, you don't have to go scouring for all these places where, um, where you're being tagged and where your content is. And you can even, I believe I haven't looked in a bit, but you can set it up or you can also have it pull in pieces of content when a certain hashtag is used. So we have a branded hashtag for, obviously there's a crossroad, but there's also hashtag we jump. So I like to pull any content that's using that. I may not use it all um, because you've got other jumpers kind of using the term as well, but you can really broaden it up as much as you want, but at the minimum, anyone who's tagging you directly on any platform and basically brings it all a fantastic tool. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you for coming on the DZ podcast today. I know uh, we've had a lot of people probably reach out to you on LinkedIn. You've kind of, we'll we'll make sure we will include your LinkedIn link on, uh, on the episode notes here. Any other uh, way they suggest you suggest they get in touch with you? What, what tell us just quickly about the CMO uh, info product or info community that you're building. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a whole like passion thing, um, and I can kind of it's called the effective CMO. Um, I have a a love for productivity, workflow optimization, time management, all that stuff, and so it's a blog where I go in and I share all the learnings I've had as sort of the CMO of, of Crossrope over the past you know five plus years. Um, so. I read a lot about EOS. I read a, read a lot about, you know, um, you know, different workflow uh, strategies. And oh, I'm planning to do a lot more writing on some of these more robust strategies, like how, how to build a creator program, how to tap into and build out a strong NPS program, um, all these different things that I've sort of learned and leaned into. So, yeah, you can find that at the theeffectivecmo.com. Otherwise, yeah, uh, find me on LinkedIn. Always excited and happy to meet other uh, others in the e-com space. And then if you want to check out uh, a fun and different kind of cardio workout, you can find us at crossrope.com. Awesome. Thanks again, Serge. Thank you, Eric. It was fun, man. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at directtoconsumeralloneword.co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.